Hi everyone and welcome to chapter 12. In this chapter we're going to talk about quasi-experimental designs. Now in a lot of the experimental designs that we talked about so far you'll notice that it has a lot to do with randomly assigning people to groups and, and sometimes withholding treatment but what we find is that we're not in a lab and a lot of times social work research is done in the field and it can take time and money and a lot of layers to work through to be able to create a complex well-structured experimental design. And so because of that, we often have alternative designs that have stronger internal validity, but are a little bit simpler to create or structure than experimental designs. And so we call those quasi-experimental designs. In this chapter, we're going to talk about what those look like and how they work. So there's several different types of quasi-experimental designs. There's the non-equivalent comparison groups design, time series designs, cross-sectional designs, and case control designs. And what you find is when you're looking on a continuum of internal validity, pre-experimental or those pilot studies we talked about, those have the lowest internal validity we talked about without a group or a comparison group or without a pretest. We don't really know if things like history or maturation have affected scores. Then we get to experimental on the other end, which is the highest level of internal validity. Quasi-experimental is kind of hanging out in the middle. A little bit more internal validity than pre-experimental, but like I said, less internal validity than experimental. So let's talk about the different types. So random assignment in social work research may not be feasible to our study. However, we still need to have a comparison group. Like I mentioned before, if you don't have a comparison group, how do we know changes didn't happen because of something external to your study? So we really want a comparison group and we call it a comparison group, not a control group, because a comparison group is when you have a group that is similar, ideally, but there's no random assignment. You can only say it's a control group when you have random assignment and you have literally randomly placed people into an experimental group or control group. When you have an experimental group and then you have another group of individuals that are similar that you feel like is a good comparison, but you haven't done random assignment, you call it a comparison group. And so again, it's not exactly the same thing, but it's very similar. Similar to the pre-experimental and experimental designs, we also use the same notation with the X's and the O's. So here's an example of one we talked about where you have the post-test only design with non-equivalent groups. And you'll notice there's no R. R is only when there is random assignment. Like we talked about in the pre-experimental designs, that post-test only design is really limited. We can't see progress over time. We can't say, oh, look, the intervention helped. What if our motivated group started with a much higher score in the first place? So we can't really assume any sort of causal impact now, there's a couple things that we can do to address that. One is we could administer a pretest. Similar to our pre experimental design, where we had a pretest, the intervention, and a post test. This time, we can have a comparison group. So a group of individuals who are similar. Maybe this is a group of individuals who are waiting on the treatment list. Maybe this is a group of individuals who haven't started the program yet, or in the first six weeks, they haven't actually jumped into the intervention. The pretest allows us to see if groups are equivalent. So for example, if I'm looking at motivation levels and I have the two groups and I do a pretest and I find that my one group that's gonna do the intervention already has a super, super, super high level of motivation and the comparison group has really low motivation, that right there tells me that maybe these are really different groups and maybe it's not the intervention, maybe it's the fact that you started with very different groups. Or the pretest could also show us, hey, maybe this group is pretty similar. Maybe they measure pretty similarly on demographics or perceptions of the issue or things like motivation. So that pretest is nice because it allows us to at least say where's our baseline for both groups so then we can have a better idea of, hey, is the group the intervention, I saw a pretty significant change. Well, they started really similar to the other group, but ended very different. Maybe the intervention did have an effect. So this is a good model to allow us to look at some of those threats for internal validity without necessarily having to do random assignment. There's a couple of other ways that we can do quasi-experimental designs. One is with multiple pretests. Sometimes, remember we talked about statistical regression and the idea that people may start out really extreme, maybe that first pretest they took on an anger scale is really high, or they've just come into a hospital setting and their depression scores are really high. But we know that sometimes over time, people might calm down, their depression symptoms might lessen. Honestly, just the idea of being in treatment sometimes, saying, hey, I'm gonna go get help, that can help improve symptoms without even having an intervention in place yet. So with this model, you would do multiple pretests. And the advantage of multiple pretests is you can already see if there's been some changes. So if we do a pretest for both groups, 
pretest one for both, and we find pretty similar results. And then we do a pretest again, let's say a few weeks later, and we get pretty similar results again. Well, if one group then has the intervention and we do a post test, and that post test shows really different results for the group that had the intervention, we might be able to say, hey, maybe that intervention is having an effect because both groups without an intervention had about the same levels through multiple pretests. So it's good, it provides some information. It doesn't paint a full picture. And one of the challenges we have is if we're taking enough time to do multiple pretests, who's not getting treatment? We always have to think about, do we provide treatment to those who are waiting? And that can be a challenge too, to say, hey, both of you, both groups are really struggling, but you know what? I'm gonna do multiple pretests while one group doesn't get any intervention, and this other group, I'm gonna do pretests and then they get the intervention. So in that time period, it could take a long time for the comparison group to get the intervention. And so again, that's one of the challenges. Sometimes what I've seen is people will do this and the group that is the non-intervention group is just the group, what they call treatment as usual, TAU. So they maybe are doing the same thing that the agency always offers, but then the intervention is a new intervention or a different intervention. So at least we can say both groups are still getting treatment of some sort, just one group has a new intervention instead of the existing one. Another design that we can do to increase internal validity is switching replication. And so this is a little bit confusing, but it's where you have two groups. You don't have random assignment. You have one group and maybe another group, a, a comparison group of some sort. And let's say we do a pretest for both groups. We really wanna see, hey, are they pretty similar at the beginning? Then we give the intervention to one group and then we do a post-test, so that O2. So we can say, hey, was there a change between the two groups on the post-test? Then what we do is we give the second group, the comparison group, the intervention, and then we do a post-test. And so this can provide some information for us. I saw this in a study where they were looking at women who were struggling with symptoms of depression. And so what they did is they did a pre-test for both. They had women on a waiting list, the women who were in the experimental group, or in that first group, they got the depression treatment. Then they took a post-test. Then those women who were waiting on the list, they were given that treatment for depression as well. And then a post-test was given to both groups. So this allows us to kind of look at things like changes across time, maturation. If we looked at the two groups and the one group that got the intervention first sees a lot of change and the other one doesn't yet, then we would say maybe the intervention had an effect. But if both groups between the pretest and post-test two end up having an increase, we may not be able to say the intervention made much of a difference. So switching replication is a really great way to administer the treatment to both groups, but still be able to test a little bit through pretest and post-test to see if there's any change between the groups based on when the intervention intervention was administered. We also can use something called time series designs, and there's a couple different ways we can use this. They're really nice because we can see changes over time. We can look at things like history or maturation, because if it's maturation, you would expect if you have five intervals where you examine someone, you would assume that maturation, you would start to see an improvement just from 01 to 05. And by that point, if you haven't even administered the intervention, but you're seeing a pretty steady improvement in behavior or mood, it's probably not the intervention. It might be an external thing. It might be history. It might be maturation. So the simple interrupted time series design, it might be helpful for one individual, but it doesn't necessarily have a comparison group to say, hey, is there a big difference between a similar group? So with this type of design, it does provide some insight and information for us. We can already see if people are changing in their first five pretests, those first five observations, and then we do the intervention, and then we can see how they reacted over time. But again, we don't really have a comparison or any sort of control group with this. And so it might appear that the baseline didn't change, the intervention changed things, but what if on the day that we started the intervention, something good happened, they got a promotion at work. We don't really necessarily have a comparison group to say, is it an external thing like a job promotion or is it the intervention itself? So to address this, you can use what's called multiple time series designs. And that is where you have one group and you do all of those observations, then you do the intervention and a series of observations. But we put a second comparison group because now we can see if both groups are changing. Let's say I have a bunch of individuals who are currently enrolled in my center and they are all doing case management. And I'm looking to see if participating in case management 
plus therapy is helpful for them. So maybe I have two groups. Both of them are in case management, but one of them I send to a therapist. And I say, okay, participants in this top group are gonna go see a therapist. Then we're gonna do a measurement. We're gonna try to see, is there a difference between the group that added therapy on or are they changing at the same rate? Could it be they both start improving because case management is just really helpful at that point? So having that second group can help us start to tease out. Is it really the intervention that made the difference or is it just something like time? The book also talks about cross-sectional designs and you see these a lot in social work for a number of reasons. It is a great way to examine differences and it's a really nice way to administer a test once. We talked about testing and retesting effects and how that can have an effect on individuals' responses. We talked about the idea that pre-test to post-test can be hard. People withdraw from studies, maybe they move, and so it can be really hard to confidently say, hey, I had 100 people do this pre-test, let's do those same 100 people a month later that can be challenging. So cross-sectional designs examine, according to Rubin and Babby, a phenomenon by taking a cross-section of it at one point in time. You may say, okay, well, I get information for that one point in time. Well, you can still compare groups in that study. So this is an example of a study that I found, a social work study. And what they did is they sent out 566 questionnaires. Now, about 339 people responded. And you can see that 305 were nurses and 34 were social workers. Then what they did is using the results from this questionnaire, this one-shot questionnaire, they were still able to compare differences between nurses and social workers. They were able to calculate differences between practice and personal experience. So they were able to compare higher knowledge scores with other factors like higher education and gender. This is a great example of they knew they only had one shot, it would have been really hard to get 339 people to respond to the pretest and a post test. They did just this cross sectional design. They did this questionnaire and they were still able to get a lot of really good data out of it. And so social work, a lot of research studies use this design. And it's also really great because you can use it in different ways. You can use it in an explanatory or an exploratory study. You can use it as a descriptive study. There's a lot of different methods that you can use. And so even though it has lower internal validity than maybe some other designs, it can have stronger external Internal validity if it's larger and a more representative study design. So at this point, because they had a large sample, 305 nurses and 34 social workers is a pretty decent response rate. Maybe this could apply or be generalizable to other nurses versus if we did a pre-test post-test and I only ended up with a sample of 12 nurses and two social workers, I might have a harder time saying this is representative of the larger group that I'm trying to study. So cross-sectional designs are really good and you'll see them in a lot in the articles that you're researching and reading in social work research. Finally, a few final pitfalls are things like intervention fidelity. This is a really important term for us, even if you don't do research. It is the degree that an intervention is actually delivered to clients. A lot of times you'll get a handbook and it'll say, here's exactly what you do for session one and session two and session three. But over time, people memorize the book or they don't adhere to it closely. Or it's not uncommon for social workers to say, you know what, I really like how they worded it, but this example relates to my population more and change it. And so if I have two groups and I say, I really wanna look at the effects of this treatment guide that I created, I have to be guaranteed that the practitioners who are administering this intervention are doing it the same. Because at that point, I'm really measuring apples to oranges. If one is doing it by the book and the other is just kind of using little bits and elements of the guide, we're not really studying the same intervention. So intervention fidelity can be a challenge. There's also the idea of contamination. Let's say I'm in a hospital and I'm doing a study on one group of individuals and I have a comparison group in a different part of the hospital. Maybe one patient knows another patient and says, oh my gosh, we're getting this really awesome group thing. Have you done that? And the other person goes, no, tell me all about it. What are you, what are you doing? Well, it's really great. The social worker said, and they start sharing all the good work. And so that can then bleed into the other group. And so even if you're trying to have a comparison group, by saying, hey, I'm gonna administer the intervention to group A only. If group A is talking to group B, you may still see those effects in group B. And so it's not necessarily gonna be a super representative result. Few other things to be aware of, you can have resistance to the case assignment protocol. It can be really challenging. All of us wanna help people who are struggling and suffering. And so if I say, hey, you've got 10 clients, but five of those, they've gotta to go to the comparison group for a little while while you only do an intervention with the other five. People may bucket that and say, no, 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 no. This person really needs to be in the intervention group first. They're really struggling. Client recruitment can be challenging, especially because we don't ever wanna coerce our clients. And a lot of them are already vulnerable. So finding clients, 
students to recruit, keeping them in the study. They may switch providers, there may be turnover, they may move out of state. It can be really challenging. It's really critical to engage the agency to make sure that the leaders, to make sure the clinicians who may be administering the intervention, to make sure that the administrative assistant who's collecting the surveys or data from the clients, we want to make sure that everyone is on the same page and they are clear about what their role is, what the intervention they're using is, and what the structure is. So that's quasi-experimental designs. For the next chapter, we're going to jump into single subject or single case designs. Thanks.